Okay. All right. Ah, Sorry yeah. for the delay. Okay. There we go. <laughs> Wonderful. Right. So a uh, very quick welcome to everyone. I'm John McAuliffe from the Vietnam Peace Commemoration Committee. Uh, this is one of many programs we've done trying to lift up, especially 50th anniversaries of important events in the history of the anti-war movement and in the opposition to it. Uh, I'm going to turn the program over to Paul Lauder, who is moderating. Paul is a retired professor from Trinity College, where he taught English and American studies. He also is former head of the American Studies Association uh, in, as president of it. In this context, he's somebody whose activism started in the civil rights movement and then in the anti-war movement with the American Friends Service Committee. Uh, with many other organizations. You can see um, bios of everybody on the blog page and uh, Paul and, and copies of all of the front covers of all of their books. Um, the way this will work is that the chat will be closed until we get to the discussion section and then it will be uh, opened. If you have questions, please put them in the Q&A and only questions in the Q&A. So, Paul, you're on. Thank you, John. Um, I am indeed Paul Lauder, and um, I will be moderating the, the discussion. As I need hardly point out, the question of how to bring an end to the war on Ukraine is high on many international agendas. Carl van Clausewitz, I think it was, who proposed that war is politics carried out by other means. Likewise, peace treaties might be seen as war carried out by other means. The questions we are addressing tonight might be then summarized as what can we learn that might be useful today from events that unfolded 50 years ago and that seemed to culminate in the Paris Peace Accords. As many of you will recall, it was a week from tonight, 50 years ago, December 18th, 1972, that the Christmas bombings of Hanoi and Haiphong by American B-52s began. Those bombings, including the destruction of the Bach Mai Hospital, went on for 11 devastating nights and were accompanied by multiple other daylight raids on the north of Vietnam. That, despite the fact that on, the, on October 26th, previously, President Nixon's National Security Advisor, Henry Kissinger, had declared at a news conference that peace is at hand. And the president had himself just been overwhelmingly reelected over the overtly anti-war George McGovern. The meetings in Paris, the election and the bombings formed a kind of prelude to the signing of the Paris Peace Agreement on January 27, 1973. The agreement ostensibly ended the American phase of the Vietnam War, but in fact failed to stop the continuing conflict between the two Vietnamese sides. This webinar casts fresh light on those events and addresses some of the myths surrounding the accord and its aftermath. In particular, we ask what role the peace movement played in the evolution of US policy? How did Nixon's victory in the recent presidential election play out in his policies? What were the goals ostensible and covert of American policy? What if anything, apart from war crimes, did the bombings accomplish? And as I said to begin, how does this history bear on the present crises of expanding conflict and stymied peacemaking that confront us? The knowledge of our speakers tonight comes from two quite different experiences. In her forthcoming book, Fire and Rain, Nixon, Kissinger, and the Wars in Southeast Asia, Carolyn Rusty Eisenberg examined thousands of pages of previously classified documents and tapes that provide a mass of gripping new details about Nixon's 
and Kissinger's policymaking and the social forces shaping their decisions. Rusty is a professor of U.S. history and American foreign policy at Hofstra University. Her new book will become available in January 2023. Her prize-winning book, Drawing the Line, The American Decision to Divide Germany, 1944 to 49, Cambridge University Press, traces the origins of the Cold War in Europe. Carolyn was an activist during the Vietnam War at Columbia University and elsewhere. In subsequent decades, she was co-founder of Brooklyn for Peace and serves as legislative coordinator for Historians for Peace and Democracy. Arnold Skip Isaacs, as a journalist, had a close-up view of events on the ground before and after the Paris Agreement was signed. He covered Vietnam for the Baltimore Sun from mid-1972 to the final days of the war in the spring of 1975, leaving in the U.S. helicopter evacuation the day before the Saigon government surrendered. He later wrote without honor, Defeat in Vietnam and Cambodia, recently reissued in a new and updated edition. When originally published in 1983, it was named a notable book of the year by both the New York Times and the American Library Association. Isaacs is also the author of Vietnam Shadows, The War, Its Ghosts, and Its Legacy, and an online report from Troubled Lands listening to Pakistani and Afghan Americans in post 9-11 America, which is available at um, www.fromtroubledlands.net. I've put that and another um, link uh, for Skip onto the chat, which will be available later on in, in the program. After leaving daily journalism, Skip traveled widely for a number of years as an educator and international journalism trainer, teaching students and journalists in more than 20 countries in Eastern Europe, Africa, Asia, and the Middle East. And uh, his website is www.arnoldisaacs.net. His book, Without Honor, Defeat in Vietnam and Cambodia, amplified that eyewitness reporting with extensive material from US government field reports and other contemporary accounts from Vietnamese on both sides. A new updated edition, as I say, has just been released. So, Rusty, you're on. All right. <laughs> I, thanks for that introduction, Paul. And greetings to all the people who I can't see. Um, as Paul reminds us, we're, we're beginning this webinar against the backdrop of an escalating, dangerous, and brutal war in Ukraine, in which the media daily reminds us of the extraordinary suffering of the civilians who live there. Forgotten or never learned by most students I encounter is any awareness of historical parallels or historical precedents for what we're seeing now. Gen January 27th will mark the 50th anniversary of the Paris Peace Accords, term as Paul indicated, terminating the US fighting in South Vietnam. Under its provisions, the United States agreed to withdraw the remainder of its troops from the country and within 60 days, all American POWs would be permitted to return, return home. Importantly, there was to be a ceasefire in place and a procedure by which the North and South Vietnamese would peacefully resolve their differences. Four days before this signing, President Nixon went on national television telling the American people that, quote, all the conditions he had laid down had been met. After an extraordinary effort, the United States had truly achieved peace with honor. He assured Americans that this settlement meets the goals and has the full support of President Thieu and the government of the Republic of Vietnam, as well as that of our allies who are affected. He looked forward to a peace that lasts and a peace that heals. It will come as no surprise, I think, to people on the Zoom that nothing Nixon said that day was true. However, it became part of a more extended narrative peddled by the president and National Security Advisor Kissinger, 
at the time and in subsequent years, which was equally deceptive. So very quickly, I'm just going to sort of bring up some fake news and remind people who don't remember what the official version was. Um, as, as expressed by Nixon, the administration has zealously pursued an honorable peace agreement for years. And by October 1972, Kissinger believed he had achieved this, an accord which ensured the freedom and self-determination of South Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. In other words, peace was at hand. Unfortunately, in the weeks following Nixon's re-election, the North Vietnamese had become recalcitrant and as of December had stubbornly walked out of the peace negotiation. This forced the administration to conduct a new round of bombing over Hanoi and Haiphong, known as the Christmas bombing. These airstrikes, and again, we're still with fake news here. These airstrikes were of course unfortunate, but by demonstrating American determination, they had compelled the North Vietnamese to return to the bargaining table. Back in Paris, they had yielded on critical points, enabling Nixon to claim that all the conditions he had laid down had been met and they had truly achieved peace with honor. If the accord subsequently failed, which of course it did, this was because the relevant parties had violated its terms. And when you look through the declassified documents and tapes, it suggests a, a very different story. When I examined the record, it was obvious that the Paris Peace Accords were imposed on the South Vietnamese government, which despised its provisions from the outset. Its content bore no resemblance to the priorities the Nixon administration had set at the beginning. And furthermore, none of the participants seriously believed the result would be peace in Vietnam. What it meant in real terms was that the United States could extricate its uh, its remaining troops in some face-saving way and get the prisoners home before fighting resumed between North and South. That raises a question. Why, after such an immense expenditure of lives, money, and international credibility, did the Nixon administration make an agreement that was truly at odds with its initial goals? The answer, I think, is threefold. One, the weakness of South Vietnam, to the dedication and zeal of their North Vietnamese adversaries, and what is most overlooked by historians, the role of the peace movement in forcing a settlement on the administration. I think the first two points are well established, namely the determination of the North Vietnamese and the provisional revolutionary government to keep fighting regardless of the casualties they were sustaining. You know, over and over, you know, these battles and the enemy would take tremendous losses and people would say, oh, well, that was really it. And then lo and behold, they popped back up again. Also clear is that despite American assistance, helping to create and equip a million man military force, the army of South Vietnam was demoralized and generally ineffective. But absent from most accounts is the role of the anti-war movement in forcing the Nixon administration to accept an unfavorable settlement. I might mention in passing that the person who gives the most explanatory weight to the peace movement is actually Henry Kissinger, who throughout his memoir identifies domestic dissent as a critical factor in their decisions. But since Kissinger is widely distrusted in many circles, people don't actually take him seriously when he says it. But in fact, that's probably one of the true things that he actually managed to say. So in what respects did the anti-war movement influence the outcome. I'm going to address this question briefly, although it's actually, I spent a lot of attention on it in my forthcoming book. The most important effect of the anti-war movement was that it forced the Nixon administration to bring the troops home. By November, 1972, the numbers had gone from 550,000 to about 30,000. And those 30,000 were not almost not, not at all really combat troops. So it's a huge change. From the summer of 1969, right up through December, the Nixon administration was taking out soldiers in large increments. Within the anti-war movement, there was a tendency to dismiss this fact. And I, I, I'm in that category of people. 
It was a trick, people said, a way to divert American attention while Nixon was escalating an air war. Anyway, it was immoral. All he was doing was changing the color of the corpses. I think we were wrong, at least in certain respects. In reality, the continued removal of the troops, which Kissinger and the US military bitterly opposed and, Kiss and Nixon did not like doing was very consequential because it meant that over time, the US could no longer fight a ground war. And since had it become increasingly apparent that the army of South Vietnam was unable to function adequately on its own, the removal of American soldiers did not bode well for the future. So come back again, why did they remove the troops? I think there's a general answer and then a specific one. The general answer is that the peace movement had created an atmosphere in the country in which Nixon needed to continuously demonstrate to the public that he was taking real steps to end the war. And troop removal was the proof. You know, one I, so, a shocking thing, I remember this from, from November 1972, was there were these polls taken at that time in which Americans were asked, you know, which person did they think was most likely to end the war? And overwhelmingly, people said Richard Nixon. And I sort of remember, you know, in the peace movement land that we were like appalled by this, like how stupid could people be? But I think what we didn't really see back then was that all these young men were returning to their communities many ahead of time from what they had, had been anticipated. So for millions of Americans, the returns of those troops was very consequential, more consequential than anything that, that George McGovern was likely to produce. So I really want to emphasize, I think the removal of the troops had enormous consequences in terms of really um, limiting what the Nixon administration could actually do. The narrower answer in terms of why they took the troops out was opposition of Congress. In the corner of the peace movement that I inhabited, everyone was disgusted with Congress. Um, year after year, anti-war resolutions were introduced, eloquent speeches were made, and inevitably these resolutions were voted down and more money appropriated. But there was another side to this, which which was the ongoing belief in the White House that if they did not remove the troops, that some of these resolutions would pass. In other words, the potential of congressional actions was forcing a change in administration policy. Nixon had a phrase for this. We're one step ahead of the sheriff, of the sheriff. Sorry, say that again. We're one step ahead of the sheriff, he was apt to say. And that sheriff was Congress. November 1972, the big news was that Nixon had won an overwhelming victory. Less notice was that congressional elections were different. More anti-war senators had been elected, increasing the likelihood that a congressional cutoff was imminent. While many activists disdained electoral work, and by then I was one of those people, at least by then others had continued and had produced valuable results. In thinking about the role of the anti-war movement during this time, I want to offer one observation, which will probably be received with extreme skepticism. And that is, the anti-war movement made Richard Nixon hate the Vietnam War. He felt it was ruining his presidency. Constantly besieged by demonstrators, he wanted them to go away. Unlike Donald Trump, Richard Nixon wanted to be regarded as an exemplary president somebody who had achieved major things on his watch. And in his mind, this never ending war with its noisy demonstrators and constant recriminations stood on the way. With these points in mind, I wanna look briefly at the developments between October, let me see if I can manage this briefly, between October 1972 and January 73, when the peace agreement was signed. When Nixon entered the White House, he fully expected to end the war quickly with a negotiated settlement. Two points were crucial, that US military withdrawal would be matched by the withdrawal of North Vietnamese troops and that a ceasefire would be accompanied by the retention at least temporarily of the two governments. By October, 1970, it had become clear that Hanoi would not accept mutual withdrawal although the importance of this would depend on how many of their troops were still in the South when the Americans left. 
Nixon and Kissinger were prepared to accept their presence, but they would not agree to the removal of the South Vietnamese government. To acquiesce would be to admit defeat. Peace talks were frozen until October 1972, when the North Vietnamese finally seemed to agree that Thieu could remain in power, at least for a while. That change of heart has been variously explained, but one powerful factor in Hanoi's change was that as a consequence of their spring offensive, there were at that point 140,000 North Vietnamese troops in the South. Um, and these soldiers were in many places, the provisional revolutionary government was actually exercising political authority in that area. In other words, Hanoi had more troops in the South then than they probably had had at any earlier time. And that made a peace agreement much less dangerous. For more than a year, Kissinger had been hyper-focused on the retention of Thieu. And when Le Dato, the North Vietnamese negotiator, finally said yes, he thought the deal was essentially done. Peace is at hand, Kissinger announced. Some thought this a trick, I did. It wasn't. In Kissinger's mind, he had saved Thieu. He should have known better. In advance of the actual text, it was already clear that the South Vietnamese were in no rush for the Americans to leave. Their preference was to continue the war until North Vietnamese troops had been driven out of the, earth, of the South. But Richard Nixon was done telling Kissinger and his NSC deputy, Al Haig, or another villain of the piece, Nixon said, this war has got to stop. I mean, that's all there is to it. We cannot go along with this sort of dreary business of hanging on for another four years. It's been too long. It's been too long. I mean it. It was time that Thieu realized that American engagement had to be approved and funded by Congress. And in the last time around, the money had scraped through only by a two-vote margin. When Thieu finally saw the actual agreement, he and his colleagues were appalled. We are on the edge of catastrophe, on the brink of an abyss, to tearfully said. When informed of this, Nixon was disgusted by the ingratitude. When you think of what we've done for him on Cambodia, what we've done in Laos, what we've done on May 8th, Jesus Christ, he owes us one now, and he owes it damn fast. Angry as he was, Nixon did not want to blow up with Saigon prior to the presidential election, so he instructed Kissinger to put the deal on hold, but not for long. Henry, let me tell you this, it has to be with honor, but also has to be in terms of getting out. We cannot continue to have this cancer tearing at us at home, eating us abroad. I'm not gonna let the United States be destroyed in this thing. So those little assholes are not gonna do it to us. When the Paris negotiations resumed in late November, Kissinger attempted to conciliate General Thieu by introducing 69 mostly minor modifications to the agreement he had reached with Le Ducto. Perhaps some of those would be acceptable. However, back in Hanoi, the members of the Politburo were furious, believing that the Americans had tricked them for Nixon's electoral purposes. In the ensuing weeks, negotiations with Le Ducto became more difficult as his government brought up charges, changes of their own that they wanted to make. Kissinger was wanting to give up, but Nixon insisted that he remain in Paris. A major concern for the president was Congress. Three of Nixon's most important allies, Senators Stennis, Goldwater, and Representative Ford were warning him that without a peace agreement in place, once the new Congress was installed, they would cut off all funding to the war. By December 8th, a deal seemed within reach. Areas of agreement had been whittled down to three sticking points, of which the most significant was wording on the demilitarized zone, the DMZ. While Kissinger's hope re hopes revived, back in Hanoi, members of the Politburo were angered by the continued U.S. bombing of their territory south of the 20th parallel, as well as the flood of American weapons, tanks, planes, and trucks that were pouring in under Enhanced Plus. I'm, I'm so used to an in-person audience that people should warn me if I'm speaking too quickly. Um, in Saigon, General Thieu had given a scalding address to the South Vietnamese people. 
denouncing the impending agreement as a cunning, crafty trick. If this agreement went into effect, he said, the annexation of South Vietnam through military means will only be a question of time. Ordered by the Politburo to return to Hanoi, Le Duc Cho informed Kissinger that disagreements had emerged between the delegation and officials at home, requiring in-person consultation. He was leaving his team's expert in experts in Paris to continue ironing out the technicalities with the Americans. While gone, he would continue to communicate with Kissinger by message. He assured the Americans that a peace agreement was within reach. In other words, Le Duc Tho was not breaking off the negotiations. And Kissinger and Nixon understood that. Kissinger returned to Washington furious at Hanoi's negotiators. Quote, what we're seeing now is their normal negotiating habit. They are tawdry, miserable, filthy people. They make the Russians look good. Supported by Al Haig, he now recommended seven days of B-52 airstrikes on North Vietnamese cities, followed by a pause. Nixon was ambivalent. Top officials were continuing to warn him that if the White House escalated its activity, Congress would cut them off. After all, this really was Chu's fault, Nixon said. If that son of a bitch hadn't insisted on total victory, they could have made the deal months before. Pressed by his, Kissinger and Haig, the, suddenly in this context, Nixon becomes a dove. Pressed by Kissinger and Haig, the president ordered the bombing of Hanoi and Haiphong that commenced December 18th and lasts until the new year. Why did they make this decision? Well, historians are writing all sorts of things about this. So I would say this, no single reason. Why did they bomb? No single reason. Anger and frustration, for sure to hurry up Hanoi, to assuage South Vietnamese misgivings, to maximize damage to the enemy before leaving the war. And because after years in office, bombing had become their default solution for problems, whether in Laos, Cambodia, South Vietnam, North Vietnam, bombing was what you did when trouble beckoned. And you didn't think very much at all about the civilians who would die or even your own pilots whose planes might be shot down, as would in fact happen daily. And so Christmas bombing began, wreaking havoc across the cities of Hanoi and Haiphong. Nixon and Kissinger had developed a preference for B-52s because of their psychological effect. Quote, here's his Kissinger, having, and this is, I think it's a memorable quote, quote, Having crossed the Rubicon, the only thing we can do is total brutality, Kissinger maintained. What's killing us now is that we have neither a settlement with Hanoi nor a settlement with Chu. And this was happening because, quote, the South Vietnamese president was an unmitigated, selfish, psychopathic son of a bitch. And since the bastard can't figure out how he's going to stay in office in a free political contest, he has effectively undermined the American position. Kind of incredible. I was even shocked when I read that. Meanwhile, the American bombs were falling on the people of Hanoi. In the downtown area, observers saw huge piles of rubble, all that was left of an apartment building and a bomb shelter. Women were pouring through the debris, looking for their missing children, who they would never find. Then, on December 23rd, the North Vietnamese government announced the Bak Mai Hospital, their largest and most modern facility had been destroyed by two separate B-52 raids. In Washington, the Pentagon was refusing to acknowledge that these acts had occurred. But when foreign observers got to the site, any doubt was removed. Everything was smashed. There were people racing all around, carrying bleeding patients piggyback out of the debris, using cranes, bulldozers, in some cases their own hands, Rescue workers were combing the rubble for victims. Around the world, people were learning about the Christmas bombings from their diplomats in Hanoi or those few journalists who were there. It did not improve the international atmosphere that American bombers had accidentally struck the embassies of Egypt, Cuba, and India, along with two foreign ships in Haiphong Harbor. There were official complaints from West European governments and numerous denunciations in the foreign press. 
The French newspaper Le Monde was comparing the American action to the German bombing of Guernica during the Spanish Civil War. The British Manchester Guardian called it the action of a man blinded by fury and incapable of seeing the consequences of what he is doing. Um, in a blistering editorial entitled Terror from the Skies, the New York Times excoriated the administration, observing, quote, the, big, the B-52 bombers that are being used for the first time over heavily populated Hanoi Haiphong are not precision weapons. What would happen in New York or some other city if a comparable enemy force was unleashed against such targets as railroads, shipyards, warehouses, community facilities. It was hard, horrifying to imagine. Perhaps the administration's point was to rebuke Hanoi for its behavior at the negotiating table. But, it was the New York Times, but this indiscriminate use of American air power to, oppose its, to impose its will on a foreign nation was terrorism on an unprecedented scale. If another nation had behaved in this fashion, the United States would be first to condemn it. As a practical matter, this operation, Linebacker 2, that's actually called, I forgot to give its name, it's Linebacker 2, accomplished nothing. Uh, it did not induce the North Vietnamese to change their position because they had already decided to make a peace agreement. Differences were narrow in any case. And ironically, on the day that the bombs started to fall on Hanoi, Le Duc Tho had received approval from the Politburo to proceed with the agreement he'd made with Kissinger. Nor did it make the South Vietnamese government any happier with the agreement. Despite Nixon's desperate wish to have a signed agreement before his inauguration, the two government denied him that wish. The reality was that the proposed settlement was disadvantageous to the unpopular South Vietnamese regime with thousands of North Vietnamese troops in the South and, the SD and this group of soldiers exercising temporary political authority in the area they controlled, and that was actually in the peace agreement. The prospects for Saigon seemed grim, but this was large, that this situation was largely the product of the two governments' incompetence and corruption did not alter the fact that Kissinger's peace deal posed a genuine problem for them. For Nixon, the remarkable fact was that after years of American military economic aid totaling billions of dollars, the government of South Vietnam was so reluctant to stand on its own two feet. It had taken him four turbulent years to reach a conclusion that many former US officials had reached much earlier, quote, that we have attended to erode their will by making them too dependent upon us. Somehow or other, the Russians and the Chinese had avoided this trap. The, the imperative was clear in Nixon's mind. We've got to get out of South Vietnam and go home. We go, and this is a quote as well, we go in and make the deal with the North and tell the South to either stick it or stuff it. And so they did. Hours before the Americans signed the agreement with North Vietnam, Saigon folded. They had no choice. Nixon made it clear that without their acquiescence, all US aid would be cut off. These final months of the US presence in South Vietnam were of a piece with all that had come before. A determination to maintain a, a client regime that bore no resemblance to a democratic country a willingness to heap destruction on the cities, towns, and fields of this smaller country and its neighbors. Under Richard Nixon, an additional 28,000 Americans died and perhaps one to two million Asians, most of them civilians. There was never a realistic way to count. Yet despite this catastrophic record, our nation has never come to terms with this history. And we confront the perils of a new Cold War world in a state of unwarranted innocence. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Rusty. Very informative and quite striking. Now we move to Skip Isaac, who was in Vietnam 
when the uh, bombings were going on and also when the peace treaty was signed. Skip. Uh, good evening and thanks to everybody for tuning in. Uh, I'm gonna begin on the day that the Paris Agreement was supposed to take to stop the fighting. Uh, this couple of people referred to January 27th, which is the, the date in Paris and Washington when it was signed in, in Vietnam. It was January 28th on the, at the, on the, in the morning of January 28th. And that's the date that in my mind is the date of the, the agreement. Some it's a little metaphor there about the difference uh, in perception and, and perspective between the, on, from, from on the ground there and in Washington and Paris. And I'll begin uh, with the scene from that day that I witnessed. Uh, and this story is in the book, my, my book. Uh, but I, I, I'll read from the original version, which is the story that I sent to the Baltimore Sun on, uh, that I wrote on January 28, 1973, Vietnam time. <coughs> and maybe these few paragraphs from that story will give some sense of the feeling and flavor of that day and how the hope of peace fell apart in those first hours. And this story opens in a hamlet on a major highway, Highway 13, about 20, 20 a little more than 20 miles north of Saigon. The hamlet was called uh, Tung Hoa. And here's how my story began. Fleeing a war that was officially over, the villagers of Tung Hoa began trudging away from the gunfire at 9 a.m. yesterday when the Vietnam ceasefire was exactly one hour old. At the head of the column, a woman jogged clumsily with a wailing child bleeding from shrapnel wounds clinging to her back. Behind her, the rest filed by with frozen faces. Vietnamese are used to suffering, a sergeant had remarked in the last village. Except for one girl of 10 or 11 who wept hysterically, an old man trying to comfort her indicated with gestures that someone, possibly her mother, had been shot. And I'll interrupt my reading here to show you uh, this, that scene on the cover of, of the new edition of my book. You can see this is, this is the woman with the baby right here. And I'll, I'll go on to say that the photo was taken by uh, Larry Green. Uh, then for, of the Chicago Daily News at that time, who was my traveling companion that day and on lots of other trips in Vietnam. Larry, who I believe was planning to uh, tune in on this webinar. And I hope he's, if he's there, thank you again for the photograph and your friendship. Larry is still a good friend. And I still remember that moment and that scene very vividly. So this cover has, has a special meaning for me. So to go back to the sun story. In the hamlet, the shells whirred in rhythmically, exploding every 10 seconds with the characteristic dull metallic slams that sound as if they were landing in rain barrels. Close by, but out of sight, rifles and machine guns sputtered among the houses. At 9.05 a.m., an hour and five minutes after the war ended, two infantrymen carried a dead or badly wounded soldier out of the hamlet. They were followed shortly by an entire infantry company, apparently abandoning the hamlet to the communists. Before anyone could ask if all the South Vietnamese were out, a flurry of rifle shots snapped the air overhead. It was clearly time to leave, and there was no way for any of us, any of us to report the result of the fight. Uh, I'll summarize the next few graphs, uh, which noted that uh, similar battles were going on all over the country where small communist units had penetrated villages or blocked roads in the last hours before the ceasefire. And from there, I circled the story, my story circled back to the actual ceasefire hour, which had been an hour earlier, eight o'clock, which Larry and I watched it in, in another hamlet called Chan Heap. We got to Chan Heap about, quarter, about 15 minutes before eight, uh, and while we were there, and when we got there, we could hear machine gun and rifle fire from just off the road on the far side of the houses and shops, and a steady thump of artillery from farther out. And here's a little bit more from my story. Most of the people in Chanhee, most of the people were standing in front of their homes, listening to the firing 
and glancing frequently at their watches, wondering if it really would stop on time. At 8 a.m., the hour of the ceasefire, on the main street, a group of soldiers, actually cadets from the Army Engineering School, who were assigned to Hamlet security for the expected heavy attacks during the last night, heard the time signal on a portable radio. And then President Nguyen Van Thieu began to speak, urging his countrymen to remain vigilant against possible communist violations. The nearby automatic weapons fire and the distant artillery did not even slow down. And there was no emotion, neither elation, nor surprise, nor shock on the faces of the villagers. The president can say anything, but this war will never end, a sergeant remarked bitterly. And that quote gave me the title for my opening chapter. Now to grasp what those snippets tell about the larger story, uh, you have to remember that this, the ceasefire was called a ceasefire in place, meaning that both sides would stop fighting and stay in the areas they controlled. Now that was a very murky issue in that war. There was lots of contested so-called so contested territory that was not really controlled by either side. Uh, but in populated areas and along the major transportation routes, most areas clearly did pretty clearly belong to one side or the other. Uh, even if opposing troops might penetrate a particular spot for a few hours or a day or two, but generally speaking, they were, you, you could identify which side owned that land. Before the agreement was signed, and that was fraught, a fraught situation for this supposed ceasefire. Before the agreement was signed, General Fred Wyand, who was the last command, US commander, MACV, Military Assistance Command Vietnam, in Vietnam, urged Kissinger and his team to push for the two Vietnamese sides to exchange lists of military units and, and their strength and location. So there would be some kind of record of uh, where each side's forces were supposed to be when the ceasefire happened. I don't know what kind of attention those ideas got or didn't get in Washington. Maybe Rusty's documents have some indication. I found no evidence that any such plan was seriously offered in Paris. And it's extremely unlikely that either Vietnamese side would have accepted that procedure anyway. But the result was that the word place in ceasefire in place was completely undefined when the ceasefire was supposed to take effect. And if the lines had really frozen, if the shooting had really stopped at, on, the, on the dot at eight o'clock that morning, communists would have blocked all the major highways radiating out from Saigon. They would have occupied a large part of Taining City, an important province capital north of Saigon, and hundreds of other places that were in no real sense contested territory. Now those penetrations came before the ceasefire was supposed to begin. So they didn't violate the letter of the agreement, but they certainly violated the spirit of a ceasefire in place. The principle that the fighting would end with both sides, at least roughly on the ground that they actually controlled. The South Vietnamese counter, the South Vietnamese counterattacks to retake the population centers and reopen the, the major roads and so on came after the ceasefire date. So they openly violated the agreement. But going by the letter of the agreement, would have left the situation way out of line with the real military balance. And, and that was clearly against the, the basic premise of the agreement. So realistically, if not technically, the communist attacks before the ceasefire and not the South Vietnamese counterattacks after it were the key violation, the crucial violation in that initial phase. It took a month or so of heavy fighting to restore more or less, quote, normal, unquote, battle lines. And if the Saigon government could have stopped or cut back offensive operations at that point, and if they had done that, we don't know what would have happened, but it's certainly possible that the communists might have dialed down the fighting too. They'd taken quite heavy casualties and might've wanted a chance for their troops to rest. But the South Vietnamese went, in the, other, went the other way. They kept their forces on all out offensive, continued full scale war for many more months through the, the, all the rest of 1973 and into the early part of 1974. And that reverses the blame equation, it seems to me. If the communist side was primarily responsible for breaking the ceasefire in the early stage by the same letter versus spirit test, Saigon was far more at fault for the continuing fighting for the next year. 
And I'll add that in my research, I found no indication that the United States did anything or any had made any meaningful effort to get South Vietnam to rein in the offensive and maybe retrieve some semblance of a truth. Instead, the Americans continued to back to his continuing war. So I would say the United States shares the blame for turning the Paris Agreement into empty words once we had our troops out and our prisoners back. Truth to the fact is that the two Vietnamese sides had completely unreconcilable visions of, of the country and its future. Both had a fundamental principle of view that the other side had no right to exist. Neither, and neither side ever abandoned the goal of a military victory. And the United States never used its leverage to moderate its allies' policies. So I believe ultimately all three were responsible for the agreement's total failure beyond the single achievement of ending the American war. Although that, even that was with various loose ends that kept dangling for a number of months afterward. Aside from that one more or less success, the agreement did not end or reduce the full-scale war that went on for two plus more, for more than two more years until the communists won entirely by force of arms, not through any peace process or any form of national re reconciliation. And lastly, <laughs> I will mention uh, that, the, that the 1973 article I just read from is in the Library of America anthology, Library of America that you may be familiar with, anthology called Reporting Vietnam, which is a collection of more than 80 wartime pieces that the editors decided were still worth reading uh, more than two decades after the war ended. And my excuse for mentioning that is that it's a really mem memorable record, that collection, spanning the entire period of the war, and it's still in print, as far as I know. So maybe some in this audience might be interested in getting hold of it. Let me move from there to a different ex excerpt on actually a different war. This one is, this is from the book and this is from Cambodia, not Vietnam. And it doesn't relate directly to the Paris Agreement, but this quote sideshow wars as they've been called had a fundamentally different nature from the war in Vietnam and the US role, the United States role in those wars in Laos and Cambodia had a different moral character. And my own saddest and angriest memories from my time are from Cambodia. And that war, that's a war that is usually just a forgotten footnote to the Vietnam story, but I'll take this chance to remember it here. So this passage is from one of my chapters in the book, specifically on that war. And it begins, the story of what Cambodia had become in three years of war was written on the faces of six or seven soldiers' wives standing at a roadblock near a place called Prek Ko. 10 miles or so south of Phnom Penh. They were listening intently to the sound of rifle and machine gun fire coming from a few hundred yards down the road on the far side of a bridge that arched over a small stream. Each of the women clutched a parcel of food. It was for their husbands, they said, who had been in battle for two days with nothing to eat. One showed me the contents of her small shopping bag. It contained a few loaves of bread, some vegetables, and four or five small tins of food, provisions that did not have to be cooked and could sustain a soldier in combat. For that, she had spent a thousand reels in the market. Her husband, a sergeant, earned only 7,000 reels a month. The women knew their husbands had not eaten because the truck with the unit's rations was still parked at headquarters. Khmer soldiers did not have a regular ration system, but were supposed to receive field rations when actually in combat. Often, as now, they did not, with the result that the government army could not operate for long away from village markets and was thus unable to patrol for more than a day or so against an enemy that moved freely through the countryside. When they saw the ration truck still parked on the second day, the women at the Preco Bridge said, they had gone to the market and had now come to find their husband's unit. But a guard at the roadblock refused to let them go on because of the heavy fighting ahead. Patiently, the women waited several hours for the firing to lessen, but then they advanced on the guard again. Our husbands are out there, one of them wailed. She shook her shopping bag in the guard's face. It trembled in her hand. She waved toward the sound of the gunfire. Why don't you let us go to them? Why don't you just kill us right here? She began to weep. The other women edged closer. 
The guard smiled, not in amusement, but in nervousness, and cradled his rifle uneasily in his arms. Plainly, he didn't want to shoot, but he didn't want to let the women walk into the midst of a battle either. The women's cries grew louder and wilder. Most of them were sobbing now, and for a moment, it looked as if they were going to walk right past the guard, daring him to shoot. But before they did, another soldier drew up to the roadblock on a motorbike. He dismounted and walked over to the women and the unhappy guard, speaking softly to them. The wailing quieted. The soldier was from the same unit as the women's husbands, and after a moment's clearly painful uncertainty, they handed him their parcels. He tied them carefully onto the rack behind his seat and drove on toward the battle. The women looked after him until he disappeared past the first bend in the road. Then, backs hunched under their thin sarongs like little punctuation marks of sorrow and despair, they turned to trudge back toward Preco. I can't read that even now without choking up a little bit. Fighting without food was nothing unusual for a soldier of the Cambodian government. Most of the time, he also fought without adequate medical treatment for his wounds, without drugs for malaria or other illness, without honest or competent officers, without any provision for allotments to his family. His pay was always inadequate, often late, and not infrequently stolen by corrupt commanders. And almost always, from the very first weeks of the war, he fought without victory. I, I haven't dug back into my file boxes, and so I don't know exactly when I wrote that story originally, but it would have been sometime in the second half of 1972 or maybe early 1973. So two years plus before the Cambodian War ended. And it shows in a small way why even that long before the end, nobody who was willing to face reality could believe that the Cambodian army was going to win that war. And that makes it impossible to see the United States role as anything but immoral. Americans supporting that war were not really trying to help Cambodians. They were sacrificing Cambodians to help their war effort in Vietnam. And there's no way to make that an honorable purpose. The circumstances in Laos were different, but the, and I won't go into it here, I don't have time, but the moral equation was the same. And it also applies to the Vietnamese communists. Uh, who similarly used territory and supported local forces in Cambodia and Laos, not for any benefit to those countries or their people, but to serve their goal in Vietnam. So I think I've used up my time, uh, so I won't read a third excerpt, but I did copy from the book, which describes X plus 60, the, 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 the day, 60 days after the agreement, when the last American troops left South Vietnam. Uh, that day is probably historically, I think, somewhat less meaningful than the, than the ones I've just uh, spoken about. But it was a day full of ironies and weird scenes. And you might find it fairly entertaining if you read those pages. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Skip. Um, Skip and Rusty, do you want to uh, have any... Uh discussion between yourselves before we turn to q and I, I, I'm inclined to think we should open it up to people. Um, okay. We can do that, Doug. Um, you're the person. Um, uh, okay, I might. Your hand on the questions and answers. So. Thank you. We don't have a lot of questions at this point. Um, I, I would um, like to uh, pose a question to Rusty. Uh, you talked about the power of the anti-war movement in um, ending the war and, and the pressure on Congress. The one other element that I have heard, which probably does not show up in the Pentagon papers that have been declassified, would be what was happening to the US military. Uh, the, the GI movement, the uh, uh, the drugs and bragging of officers and the various other things that were happening, which I think was also a very significant um, element in the American need to pull the troops out of Vietnam when they did. Uh, could you comment on that? 
Yeah, I, I have mixed, I mean, uh, this obviously has been discussed by a lot of people and a lot of excellent research has, has been done about that. Um, you know, I'm, it, in terms of, if you ask the question, like, what influenced U.S. policy, right, as opposed to other things, what my thought about what was happening in the military in Vietnam, first of all, I think was making less of an impression than what the veterans were doing back here in the United States, at least as far as I can discern from the record. I mean, I know that, you know, there obviously were, as, as time went on, the demoralization of the army, the lack of cooperation, you know, becomes more and more apparent. But, you know, to some extent, you know, especially as you get in those latter years, Nixon really was taking the troops out. <laughs> Not happily, but he felt like he had to do it. But I think that a different way of conceptualizing it is to sort of see it as part of a whole, that you have reports of terrible morale among the troops. You have troops that are in Vietnam that are sending messages back home, which are making a very negative impression. You have veterans, you know, marching in, in Washington, turning back their medals. You know, that there's a kind of a much broader, undifferentiated sense that this is part of what the administration is dealing with. And, you know, it's part of what makes Nixon feel that the situation was ultimately unsustainable. Um, so, you know, I think it's very hard to like draw a line about, you know, exactly what was, you know, a newspaper story about a group of soldiers that were refusing to fight versus a newspaper story about people burning their draft cards versus a newspaper story about those uh, those veterans up on Capitol Hill throwing their medals away. I mean, I think it was all part of a whole. And the whole was communicating that this project was not sustainable and it needed to end. So I don't know, Doug, if that's evasive, I think that answers your question. Thank you. Uh, another question was, um, how does Nixon's China policy relate to the ending of the Vietnam War? Well, I, I mean, actually, a lot of my book is actually about that. And it's a very important question. I just, you know, didn't even want to get near it for this, um, you know, given, you know, the complexity of this topic already. Um, the China policy is very closely related um, to the Vietnam War in many ways. I mean, I think that what was true, even absent Vietnam, was that there was a recognition by Richard Nixon, certainly, and, and by Kissinger as well, that U.S. policy toward China needed to change. You know, and that was particularly clear at the point at which the Russian-Chinese split had become, you know, more and more visible. So the desire to have some opening to China you know, was was really there from the beginning. However, um, their efforts to get that opening were initially stymied because the Chinese got furious about the U.S. Um, about the U.S. going into Cambodia. So, it really, was not until you know early maybe March of 1971 that then the Chinese again opened the door, and that was actually a very significant moment because. What happens in the spring of 1971 is that that's a moment when there is a major South Vietnamese operation in Laos called Lam Sun 719. And this was going to be the first time that South Vietnamese troops were supposed to mount a major operation without American ground troops, although they could have uh, air support. And that turns out to be a huge fiasco, and it is a disaster for the administration multiplied by very big peace, peace demonstrations in Washington that happened you know, right around the same time, multiplied by the veterans coming to Washington and doing their demonstration, by Daniel Ellsberg's papers. I mean, things are getting going from bad to worse. When the Chinese give an opening, Kissinger is ecstatic because he believes that this is what's gonna save them. Nixon is very clear that his administration is in big trouble because his policy is floundering. Kissinger says, this will help us. How will it help us? And this is really two things that are relevant here. One is it'll take the story off the front pages. Right? What, that this is going to be more exciting. And of course, if Nixon could go to China, 
<laughs> then even better for the front page. So that's very important, is that it takes the story off the front page. So that was their hope. Um, additionally, once that relationship is open, Kissinger gets like super excited because he really thinks that now he's got a brilliant key that he's going to get the Chinese to help him with Vietnam, that Russia is going to become more cooperative because he's getting along with the Chinese. In other words, he, he begins to spin, you know, all of these webs. Um, and, you know, we could talk more about, um, you know, what the, what the practical outcome of that is. But really from early on, Nixon and Kissinger's diplomacy with the Chinese is very much shaped by their dilemma in Vietnam. And, it, and, and you could even take it a step further, which is to say, and you know, one of the things I've done is to read the transcripts of these negotiations with the Chinese and then later when they go to Russia. And I think to some extent, what ends up happening, ironically enough, is that both Nixon and Kissinger end up being much more forthcoming with the Chinese and with the Russians because there is such a mess over Vietnam. And increasingly, Richard Nixon begins to see these two communist superpowers as the thing that will burnish his image as a man of peace. So I, when you actually look at what those negotiations look like, and they're really shocking. I mean, you have to have a little patience to read them. But when you look at them, you say, oh, my God, this is really happening because they are making all these concessions. And one last thing I just say very quickly, which is about Taiwan. Um, one of the things you see in this negotiation is that Kissinger is giving all kinds of assurances to the Chinese about how unconcerned we are about Taiwan. And he's sort of vague and Joe and Lai says, well, you know, it isn't so smart to be vague. It's going to maybe cause trouble later on. Kissinger said, don't worry. Um, not surprisingly, he's recently called for, you know, a friendlier attitude. But again, to just summarize more details than anyone wants to hear, I think that the effect of their mess in Vietnam is to make them seek much more vigorously agreements with Russia and with China. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, what was the most surprising thing that you learned from reading classified documents, Rusty? The most surprising thing that I learned. It's hard to say. Well, <laughs> the thing I said <laughs> earlier was really surprising which was um, that Nixon <laughs> grew to hate the war. He, by the end, he was desperate to get out. And for me and every person I knew in the peace movement, you know, we all have this view, oh, Nixon would stay there for eternity. He'll never leave. How will he ever go? And so when you start to see that he's just the desperation there, is, that's a little bit shocking. The other thing I would say, Doug, is I did not begin my research with uh, even... A, a clearly formulated desire to explore the impact of the peace movement. You know, I still had left over from that time a kind of sense of disappointment that we hadn't really done anything, that we had these demonstrations, they took forever, nothing, nothing happened. So I would say on balance, when I was looking through all the records, the thing that was really impressive to me was that impact that we did have. And I would include in that, you know, the developments in Congress which were far more important than anything, you know, I mean, my friends thought about, you know, back then. Um, to what extent do you think the U.S. intelligence community bears actual responsibility for U.S. service personnel becoming addicted to heroin uh, during the armed struggle in Vietnam? You know, I, I actually feel like I can't answer that, you know, knowledgeably at all. I don't know if Skip has some thoughts about that. Not really. Uh, I mean, the. Uh, I guess my the only answer that I would give would be not to directly address that specific question, but to point out that the backdrop to all of this, including the changing attitudes that Rusty is talking about, uh, was not so much the issues that the anti-war movement was raising about the war, but the fact that the war wasn't getting anywhere. And people became people who had no sympathy with the peace movement at all. But they had got sick and tired of looking at kids coming home in body bags and then nothing was being accomplished by it. And I think that that was a powerful, and I think that also explains the changing climate in Congress. I think they, you know, yes, 
the disruption of life and the the sort of the, the sense of a divided and fragmented society and the unrest and all that. And don't remember this came on the heels of uh, the civil rights movement and the and the riots, the ghetto riots in, in New York and elsewhere, uh, which preceded really the, the height of the anti-war movement. And the feeling that the country was falling apart in part in large part over Vietnam certainly had it had some influence on those congressional views. But there was no the other part of it was all the people who said, win or get out, which was not the 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 at all the ideology of the peace movement. Uh, but that was, I think, my sense, a more powerful motivator or driver of the change in the public attitudes. Let me add one one thing. I was the director of the U.S. Servicemen's Fund in the early 70s, which supported GI anti-war work. And we heard a lot from uh, GIs, both from Vietnam and in, in bases around the, the country. And one major uh, phenomenon had to do with the simple fact that the increasingly the American military on the ground was a not a, um, a, a, a dependable military force. It was a, a decreasingly dependable. And uh, I was persuaded then, and I remain persuaded, that the um, uh, part of the, the policy that the, the Nixon and Kissinger people were uh, trying to develop had to do with the fact that you you did not have an army that you could feel you could rely on. And um, that, after all, has a, a lot of consequence. And I know this speaks to one of the questions that somebody had, had raised before. Uh, if you don't have an army that you can rely on, uh, how can you continue to uh, have a war on the ground? And, and that that motivates the movement toward um, air power, and it also um, actually began to uh, raise questions about some of the um, airmen. Go ahead, Doug. Uh, one of the participants uh, writes, the NLF was not happy with several elements of the Paris Peace Accords. One of those was that um, the prisoners being held uh, by the South Vietnamese government were not um, to be released under the accords. Madam Bin's own brother was being held in the tiger cages. Could you comment on this or any other aspect of the peace agreement that the NLF was unhappy with uh, with regard to uh, the agreement that was negotiated with the North? Well, I agree with that. Um... I mean, I think that that's true, that the that the provision about prisoners was very disappointing to the NLF, um, you know, in a way. And, and, and that had been really even by October. Uh, Les Actos had expressed a willingness to put that request aside that, you know, even though he was agreeing that the American POWs could come home, he was not going to insist you know, on on the release of, of NLF prisoners. Um, and I think the fact that, I mean, I think there's, that gets to deeper questions where I wouldn't even claim expertise about the relationship between the North Vietnamese government and the provisional revolutionary government of Vietnam. I think that was more complicated. But in any event, that was a very significant point that Le Dato was willing to yield. And it also, I think, attests to the eagerness in Hanoi to get the Americans out of there. Later, when they when the Americans sort of blow up the deal, at least temporarily, then Le Dato brings it back and says, well, oh, by the way, these 30,000 people should be released. But I believe that by the end, they had given that demand up as well. Um, if if I could, I, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. I just want to introduce one fact about that, that issue, which is that the U.S. did not hold any prisoners, war prisoners, in Vietnam. Anybody captured by U.S. troops was turned mm -hmm. over to the South Vietnamese. And the Saigon government 
was the one was the the institution that held those prisoners, then they were the ones that would have to release them. So it was not a it there was not a decision that the U.S. could make, or at least not unilaterally. And and that and that and it was and there was there were some prisoner exchanges, which were kind of scary, uh, because not only on the, the 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 slowness with which the South Vietnamese released fairly small numbers of the prisoners they held, and they accepted they they refused as I I have not gone back to look at these details I once knew them pretty in more detail. I think they held they held back on the ones that they considered political offenders and gave back the, the, the traditional military, you know, POW types who had been captured on the, in, the, in battle. Uh, but the North Vietnamese or the, the Vietnamese communists, the NLF and the North Vietnamese released quite a small number of, of, of the prisoners that they had captured or at least that had gone missing from the South Vietnamese side. And I don't know that anyone has ever found out or sort of probed this or, or dug up the, the facts, but there was certainly a, a, a sense that a lot of them had been executed and that that's why they didn't turn up in the prisoner releases after the war. And the number who had been reported as captured, there, you know, other, other fellow soldiers saw them being uh, surrendering and being led away. Uh, I think the, the communist side and some of them probably converted and went over to the communist side willingly or as a means of survival, one or the other. But there was a fairly strong current of speculation and what the basis what would be, I really have no grounds to say that a lot of them had been just been shot on the spot after surrendering. You know, I, I if, can I just jump in here, not on the prisoners, because I think, you know, I just don't have the knowledge to take people's time. But I do want to come back about the peace movement. And I suspect if we went on, probably Skip and I would have a somewhat different um, feeling about it. And, and again, I didn't really start out, you know, oh, well, you know, I'm writing this thing to show that the peace movement was really great. And by the way, you know, I, I think it's important to say that although I think that the peace movement did have a very strong and ongoing influence on events. This is not a triumphant story, right? I mean, it took a long time. A lot of people died before this war was brought to an end. So I don't, you know, I, I, it's sort of a funny position to say on the one hand, we had a lot of influence. On the other hand, we could have done a lot better. I mean, every day we didn't end the war was a bad day, right? It goes without saying. But I, I do think it was more influential. And I think even if just to take this back for, a moment. I even think that in the transition from Johnson to Nixon, that even though, again, it seemed absolutely appalling that after all the organizing that had gone on all those years, that in the end, there's no anti-war candidate and Richard Nixon wins. So all of that was very upsetting. But I don't think it meant that the peace movement was without influence. And I think it would be accurate to say that from the time that Nixon came in, that it deal really was a goal to get out. The, the complexity was that it would be like Lyndon Johnson and probably John Kennedy had, had he lived, you know, that, that he didn't want to get out unless he had achieved you know, particular objectives. And so the war went on and on. But there was that kind of mindset and also the feeling, I can't, I can't emphasize it enough, that the troop withdrawals were very critical to maintaining domestic dissent. I'm sorry, forget that word. <laughs> very critical to maintaining domestic consent, that that absolutely had to go on, even if it was devastating to the American war effort. I, I, I certainly agree that the piece that the anti-war movement was a significant influence on the direction of American policy and actions. I'm just saying that it was not the only force that was by that time on the side. I mean, at the end, at the end of the Johnson administration, the Cold War establishment on the whole, almost all of them, had decided that Vietnam was not worth the expense and the, the, the disruption of, of American life, but also the economic impacts and everything else. And Dean, people like Dean Acheson, Clark Clifford, uh, 
a, a whole range of people. I, in Nixon's own administration, my sense, Rusty would know this much better than I do, was that somebody like Mel Laird was always on the side of getting out. But I think it, that, but I think the issue here is that, you, and, and of course, many historians even make this point, well, you know, back in 68, the wise men had decided that this, you know, things weren't going well and so forth, or... Uh, and certainly Melvin Laird, that was one of my other surprises, which we may or may not get to later, that because I always thought he was terrible, but he was probably the strongest advocate, you know, for troop withdrawal and solution of the problem of anybody in the administration. But the important thing to understand is that these people, or I always say, a lot of these establishment people, they turned against the war because of the protests. Right? I mean, in other words, it's not just that they suddenly, you know, Dean Acheson, you know, was not somebody who was like a, you know, a peace kind of person. Right, but but these a lot of these people, I can't say every one of them, but I would put Mel Laird in that category. I mean, Mel Laird was partly one as the Secretary of Defense, right? He was somebody who Nixon had appointed because Mel Laird was from the Congress. He was a Republican, powerful Republican in Congress. And throughout the whole four years, Mel Laird was in constant touch with colleagues in Congress. And he was feeling that pressure that was coming up from the grassroots, including from his own children, right? That they're marching around, um, you know, so, and, and how many of these folks, you know, had a very similar situation. So I think it's tricky. I don't mean to just sort of annihilate the point, but I think a lot of that establishment dissent comes because of the social upheaval that's being caused. And I, you know, I've mentioned this, I think in one other talk that we had, and I always think it's really instructive that David Rockefeller, who, you know, was one of the people that Kissinger, you know, most admired in the planet, you know, so David Rockefeller goes to the School of International Affairs at Columbia University, and he spends a day talking to students, right? And what does he learn? He learns that even in this place, that students are furious, disgusted, alienated, distrust authority, right? So then David Rockefeller comes back and he talks to Kissinger. And part of what he's saying is we're losing our youth. Right? We're losing our youth. And I think you see that really, you know, throughout that a lot of these establishment people, you know, who are who are weighing in are weighing in because of what's happening in the, at the grassroots. There's a question here. Um... On Kissinger's memoir goes out of its way to diminish the role of the resistance in the South, partly by making Tio out to be the problem, and especially of Madame Bin's role in the Paris Peace Accords. Um, are we too beholden to a fake North versus South narrative? I'm not sure how to answer that, actually. I wonder if Skip has some thoughts about that. Well, this is. Uh, I guess this is really not my area of expertise either. Uh, I, I think that the shots were called in, in Hanoi and the leadership of the Vietnam Communist Party in North Vietnam was the, by far the, the in control of policy and actions. There were tensions all along uh, between the Northern communist leaders and the leaders of the communist movement in South Vietnam. But I think the balance of power was always heavily on the, on, in, in the corner of the North. But, you know, I think- uh, that, that, As I say, this is not a, a I, I wouldn't classify that as an expert opinion, but from everything that I have absorbed over many, many years and from my own coverage and from whatever sort of random uh, contacts and reading, that, that's, the, that's the, what appears to me to be the, the, the accurate answer. But, but, you know, I think what's interesting, I, yeah, I don't disagree with that, um, but I think what is interesting and worth looking at is the role that Madame Bin and people, members of the PRG who are in Paris played in terms of the international peace movement. Yeah. Because that was very important. Now, you yes. know, Kissinger and Nixon, you know, we talk about that as proving treason, right? That, you know, that, um, you know, young people are being manipulated by these communists in Paris and they're, you know, betraying, you know, who are, who are, you know, causing them to undermine their own country and so on and so on. But if you sort of take away some of that pejorative language and just look, 
Right. I mean, what certainly is happening is that that the PRG delegation in Paris is constantly move, meeting with young people from all over the world, including from the United States, and really communicating to these young people, you know, what they're about, what their vision is. Um, and I think also a very intense sense of nationalism, actually, you know, that, you know, made a very deep impression. So I think that in that respect, that the PRG delegation, you know, was really, you know, was really important in yeah, terms of I, what happened here in the United States. I don't know that it's that important in the final terms of the agreement. I just don't have a sense of the internal dynamics there. Well, the, the, the ideological uh, sort of claim of the communist side was that the war was a revolution in the South by South Vietnamese communists. The realities of who had who exercised power uh, were not necessarily that way, and that was the the, the framework of all these sort of public relations uh, ventures by the PRG, and they always claimed to be the sort of the driving force of the revolution. But I think that history is pretty clear that uh, they were really a subordinate uh, to the the, the 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 Communist Party in in North Vietnam. I, th I think the fact that the PRG uh, put a woman, woman as the head of uh, their delegation there had uh, great significance and also made um, relations with the, the broader movement, I think, um, easier and- um, I can testify to that. Yeah. Yeah. A um, couple uh, questions for the future kind of, um, what do you think the Paris Peace Agreement, what was its relevance to Vietnam in the future? Why did we go through a 20-year period of terrible relationships, and then suddenly we are now uh, close friends with Vietnam again? Any understanding on any of that, or is that after your book? That's after my book, although one could ask the question, why, what type of, you know, I was looking at the New York Times today about Cuba, right? And you said, well, why, <laughs> you know, are we, are we treating Cuba in the way that we are, like a zillion years, you know, after Fidel Castro came to power? But I think in terms of the delay, you mean, in, in improving relationships, um, you know, I don't think there's a single answer to it, but I think one simple thing is that this was a devastating American defeat, right? I mean, one could argue plausibly, again, that the agreement that Henry Kissinger and, and Le Gatoa initiated was itself an American defeat. But certainly as it got played out, you know, it, it was. I mean, it's, you know, a terrible um, demonstration of American ineffectual <laughs> Activity, right? This is a massive military commitment that went on for years and years. So they had nothing to show for it. And a lot of Americans died, you know, even if you don't care about Asian people, you know, right? Americans had died, the kids are coming home, you know, with wounds, mental wounds, physical. I mean, this is all terrible from an American standpoint. I think the less said about it, the better. So I think, you know, it's there's spite, there's malice, there's shame. I think all of that. I, I would say I would add to that just just uh, I, I think the Paris Agreement is really not significant in in the the evolution of U.S. Right. Vietnamese relations after the war, and I think you also need to mention the sort of disproportionate uh, influence of the MIA myth and right. the the MIA POW families who pushed this completely untrue uh, story, but had a big following. Uh, that the Vietnamese had, were still holding American prisoners and that they hadn't released all the prisoners and all that sort of stuff. And the problem was that there was no real strong uh, benefit to standing up against those that movement. So the, the facts were clearly, from the beginning, the it was clear that that was not, that that was a myth. I mean, there may have been a couple, couple of isolated cases of prisoners. There was one who turned up uh, some years after the war ended, but uh, that as a matter of policy and that, that in a scale of hundreds of prisoners uh, being held back, that was obviously not the case. 
Uh, but that that story had a lot of had a long shelf life and had a lot of a political pull, and they were politically in a stronger position than the people who wanted to, to to strengthen relations, and that was a big factor in delaying normalization. I think the final question, which I think both of you could uh, comment on, is: Did the U.S. learn anything from the events that we have discussed this evening? <laughs> Or are we repeating the same mistakes today or in recent years in Iraq and Afghanistan? You know, I'll answer that very quick, quickly and glibly. I mean, everybody on this Zoom probably could independently notice all the lessons anybody failed to take from that experience. Um, but I do think at least there are at least two lessons that they did learn. One was to get rid of the draft. Right. And to create an all volunteer army. That was, I think, lesson number one. And, you know, we're still living with the ramifications of that. I think a secondary lesson that they learned was better control of the press. Right. I mean, back in the Vietnam War, I mean, again, um, Skip knows, could comment much more uh, knowledgeably than I, but back then, American reporters could go all over the place and see a lot of things. But when the U.S. went into Afghanistan or into Iraq, you know that these that the effort to control everything that the press would see or not see was very profound. So I think those are the two lessons they did learn. Um, and the ones we would probably all wish they had learned, I, I, I think they didn't, and we know it. Yeah. Yeah. I, Skip, I do you have anything? Well, no, I agree with that. Yeah. I think that the uh, uh, in in the last in the in the revised last chapter of my book, uh, I mentioned that uh, in the military and national security leadership, there was a kind of amazing, and you can't help feeling willful forgetfulness. And I I, I can't imagine that I'm the first to have thought of this word, but I had not seen it elsewhere, and I called it amnesia. Uh, but I think that the 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 and Afghanistan particularly. I heard Vietnam ghosts clanking their chains all the time reading the news from Afghanistan. And I think it, it really is amazing how we repeated the same mistakes. And the underlying mistake of all uh, was that we never recognized the weakness of the governments that we were supporting. It was Sun Tzu who's, who's supposed to have said, you know, know your enemy, which is kind of the religious the, the, the scriptures of the intelligence community. And I came back from Vietnam thinking that there's another rule, which is know your friend. And that was the one that we didn't follow and that brought us down. Yes, indeed. It's now 8.31 and we um, need to bring this to a conclusion. Uh, John, um, you- uh, Are you hearing me? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, let me let me just quickly say two things that I tried to send in chat, but I may not have gotten through. And I think Sophie Quinn Judge did too, which the area that hasn't been discussed at all is the third force and the political provisions of the Paris Agreement and what it would have meant had those provisions been honored, whether either side ever intended to honor them. I don't know if you'd like to take a quick shot at that before we wrap up or whether that's a whole other program we need to do with Sophie and others. I, I will point out that after the Vietnamese communists won, they locked up most of the prominent third force people. They didn't want those people out running around loose uh, at all. Um, so they also the other incorporated a number of them into the unified government. Well, uh, Nobatan, uh, the Newspaper the editor. We, we, we can argue about the particulars, but uh, the fact is that there was no independent third force. Left. Well, that's true. I agree, Skip. But the question yeah. is, had those political provisions been taken seriously by either or both sides? In, well, that, in, that was never going to happen. Would that have changed the way things developed? Yeah, I, I, if I can just pop in real quickly on that. I mean, I second what, what Skip is saying. Um, 
those political provisions, you know, for a council of national reconciliation that would be three parties and so forth, there was never any intention for that to work. And Kissinger was very explicit about that. To him, part of his success in negotiation was to get this sentence in the agreement that he was confident could never work. So, I mean, it was absolutely cynical in terms of, of how that was being thought of in, in the Nixon administration. All right, well, I think we may need to have a whole other discussion <laughs> of that. But, and Sophie, I hope, could be part of it. Um, let me just say in, in wrapping up, thank all of you for an excellent presentations and moderating and finding questions in the, in the mix that were worthy of further discussion. Um, we are, Vietnam Peace Commemoration Committee is looking for other ways to acknowledge, remind people about the destruction of Bach Mai Hospital and the events that took place during the Christmas bombing. And uh, we hope that we'll be able to get something out to everyone soon about those pro that program when it's set up. Um, otherwise, everyone will receive tomorrow, if all the technology works, a, a link on YouTube of this program. We hope you will share it with friends and colleagues who uh, were not able to see the program. And also I have to say for the, you, you will see a note in that notification of the need for funds to help pay for these programs. Uh, Zoom is not free and all of the uh, publicity, the promotion organizational work that is done is not free, even though all of the speakers are completely uncompensated and doing this from their love from the issue. So thank you very much to everybody and we will probably see you again in uh, future programs. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.